Wisconsinites in the Capitol doing an exit interview with a historic figure in Wisconsin politics. Democratic Senator Caleb Frostman, who represents the 1st District, was elected on June 12 of 2018. He will be out of office on January 7 of 2019. And Senator, thank you very much for sitting down with us. You betcha. Have you checked for sure that you will be the shortest serving state senator in Wisconsin history? I have not checked for sure, but it's a catchy uh, phrase, so I use it often. But uh, yeah, I have not checked, but I have a hard time believing that anyone else served in the state Senate uh, shorter than six months. I've heard there was an assemblyman that resigned within a month or two, but uh, within the Senate, I don't think anyone's been less than six months. Well, you're treating this pretty well. I mean, some people would be angry and resentful. You've been your first maiden speech. You joked about it. How, how are you doing with this? Doing really well. I mean, I think it helps um, having been through adversity and been through things worse in an election loss. You've got perspective on what really matters and, of course, the issues that I'm fighting for, I believe in, and they matter. Um, but it's one of those things where uh, I was really pleased with the results at the top of the ticket and hoping that some of the energy we generated throughout uh, the first Senate district and our win generated throughout the state might have had uh, an impact on the enthusiasm for the statewide races helps uh, and having folks with you know, my political um, ideologies winning all five constitutional offices and Tammy Baldwin winning uh, eased a lot of that pain. But in the first district, what was the difference? Special election on June 12th, regular election November 6th, what happened? It went your way on June 12th, didn't go your way on November 6th. What happened? Yeah, so my postmortem while laying in bed on election night was, um, first of all, turnout. So in the special election, 28,000 votes were cast. In the general, it was like 85,000, so a threefold Three increase. Um, and, you know, along with the, the, the turnout was, for me, it was maps, maps, and kind of more maps. And so it's hard hard to overcome maps with three times the turnout and um, and to some extent outside spending. We had uh, our friends match their um, spending, so it really, uh, I think, kind of came down to, to maps and um, to turnout. So I think we were able to generate a ton of enthusiasm the entire time, but when you only have 28,000 votes, it's easier to win by a margin of 800 uh, than when you have 85,000. So. Republicans had represented the first district, uh, Frank, and then Alan Lassay for mm -hmm. decades. Mm -hmm. Is that, d d does the GOP have a lock on the first district, Senator? Uh, I think with the way the lines are drawn today, I don't know if they have a lock on it. It's tough. We put everything we had into it and I think um, did the math. We ourselves raised $700,000. Mm -hmm. I knocked on more than 10,000 doors myself. We had a really good reception um, from folks throughout the first district. So um, hopefully in 2021 with new maps coming out, likely drawn by the court, since I don't think we'll see much agreement between the legislature and the governor, uh, there'll be a chance there. There are areas that have been bluer than ever before. Um, you know, it's a parts of six counties, but you know, Door County went uh, pretty overwhelmingly blue, both in the in the special and in the general. So there are signs of optimism, but um, yeah, I think it was a nine or 10 point loss. I didn't stop paying attention after a certain point, but uh, I think with, with new lines in 2022 that uh, hopefully all districts come back and play, uh, but the first district might be more competitive. Was it the way the first district, the, the lines that drew, that, that, that encompassed the first district, the way it was drawn, or was it the fact that it's been a Republican district forever? Yeah, I, th I think it's a little bit of both. And so yeah, you try to be as clear headed about this and, and, and um, take an objective viewpoint as to what the issue is. But I think, there's, I think it's both. I think it's the number of Republicans and how long it's been Republican. So um, it's extra hard to sway those folks that have been voting that way for a long time. And we, we tried our best and put forward you know, why our vision uh, for Wisconsin was better for the working man and why it was better for your average Wisconsinite and we, and we fought really hard. Uh, but I think it's hard sometimes when yeah, an area has been represented um, by a certain political party for a long time to, to sway those folks. And so maybe in addition to the number of Republicans, they're also perhaps more staunchly uh, in that camp. So it was, I have no regrets. I met a lot of really interesting people, smart people at the doors that were of all political backgrounds. And so it's uh, no regrets, and we had a lot of fun. Well, as I look it up, you are historic in several ways. You didn't get to give your maiden speech on the floor of the Senate <laughs> till about 6.10 or 6.15 last Wednesday morning. The Senate had been, been in session for 30 hours. Everybody was tired. Um, and on that day, you cast 13 no votes and two yeses. Were those the only votes you're, you're going to cast in, in, in this stint in the Senate? They are, yep. So I was... Uh, I've been involved in the board of directors for the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation as a legislator. Yeah. So those I've cast votes there, but as far as you know, floor votes, that will likely be it unless some other extraordinary session comes up in the next three weeks, which I haven't heard about, um, but it's likely that those 15 votes will be the only ones that I'll take. Did you get a chance to introduce any bills, Caleb? Nope. You did not? No. Nope. And had you gotten a chance to introduce a bill, the first one would have been what? Um, that's a great question. So I think we've 
I think I want to make sure that as we look at economic development projects going forward, I wanted to see a greater emphasis placed on wage growth. So as we look at whether it's tax credit programs or, or um, uh, grants or those kind of things, looking at a way to make sure that we place enough pressure on companies receiving taxpayer benefits to improve quality of life beyond looking at the margins of the employment pool. Obviously, we should be focusing on workforce recruitment, but I think too much emphasis is placed on you know, the 3% of the people that aren't working, whereas there's a huge swath of Wisconsinites that are working and are not seeing the kind of returns they're looking for. So modifying uh, tax credit programs to look at ways to put additional pressure on wage growth would have been a huge priority for me. It's a minor point, but maybe it isn't. Do you expect to be listed in the blue book uh, <laughs> having served less than seven months? You know, I don't, I don't think so because uh, the 2017, 18 blue books are out and I will not be serving in the 19, 20 session. So uh, we've joked about that, that it's, un, it's likely that I won't end up in a blue book, which doesn't bother me at all. It, it seems strange, um, but I'm not going to lose much sleep over it. I understand. Yeah. Let's talk about your maiden speech, your last speech on the floor of the Senate. Mm -hmm. You said you'd spent the weekend reading the lame duck bills and you would rather be up to your <laughs> armpits in uh, cleaning some of the deer that you shot than reading those bills. You said uh, it makes you uh, weak in the knees to read those bills. Um, why, uh, you obviously voted no, but why would you rather be cleaning, gutting deer than voting on those bills? Yeah, well, when I'm field dressing deer, something good has happened and that's a good sign. But uh, yeah, that, the, the, the analogy was just that I have a strong stomach and it takes a lot to make me queasy. And having read these bills on Friday and again on Saturday and Sunday and caucusing on them uh, Monday and then voting Tuesday, Wednesday, um, kind of, the, well, not kind of, the unprecedented you know, power grab of kind of sore losership here that you know, this crisis of conscience it's such a coincidence that it happens a month after Scott Walker loses and we're seeing unprecedented stripping of powers from the governor and the AG and you know, essentially making it not all of their campaign promises, but what the, the will of the Wisconsin voters was throated and that they, they voted for the vision of Josh Call, the vision of Tony Evers and Mandela Barnes, and these actions were essentially stopping some of those promises from coming true. And so it was really uh, disheartening and just it really did make me you know, queasy and nauseous to see um, what I kind of saw as a shameless naked power grab and then to be additionally frustrated by uh, my Republican colleagues trying to rationalize these things as it really is an imbalance of power. Well, you know, where was that outrage for the last 170 years or even the last eight years when we've had a Republican governor in office? Um, so it was really frustrating to see my Democratic colleagues pour their heart out on the floor and make, you know, incredibly compelling articulate arguments uh, to kind of the blank stares of my Republican colleagues who if you guys watched the video, that not one Republican senator made one comment on one bill the entire 30 hours other than to vote or move or do other parliamentary procedures or respond to a question or two. So it was really telling. What did you learn about how the state Senate works that you didn't know on June 10 when you were a candidate and not <laughs> mm -hmm. a state senator? Well, it's funny. Within the 17 or 20 hours that we were on the floor, I learned a ton about parliamentary procedure. I'm such a... <laughs> A green order when it comes to that, so it's interesting to watch all those things happen. But um, I was surprised at how little debate from the majority party in terms of their positions happened on the floor. In fact, it was none. It was all caucusing behind closed doors. They had their votes figured out. So that was, um, I don't know if frustrating is the right word, but surprising to me that the debate that happened on the floor was the minority party imploring the majority to consider some of these issues. It wasn't necessarily um, a communication of why these votes were happening in the numbers that they were. It was just dead silence from the outer ring and uh, a really passionate imploring of, of the majority party to consider other measures that uh, fell on deaf ears. How many committee meetings did you have a chance to attend in your less than seven month tenure? Oh man, probably about 10 and they were all with uh, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Okay. So yep. you were not, um, there were no standing committee meetings? No, nope, I think, yeah, obviously had I, had I prevailed in November, we would have found some more of those, but for the six month term, um, Weedick was a good spot for me. Well, once upon a time, this place uh, operated largely on collegiality. Did you have a chance to build up a relationship with any Republican senators? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's the interesting thing is I really feel like there are Republican senators who I'd love to share a duck blind with, or I don't golf, but go golfing with like people that I really enjoyed talking to on a personal level. But um, I, that's something that surprised me also. That there was so little one-on-one -on -one back and forth about why my vote was nay and theirs was I and, and what, you know, what could either one of us do to change the perspective? It was you know, caucusing separately and coming back and taking these votes. Um, but I do, you know, I feel like I built a decent relationship with um, 
you know, President Roth, we disagree on almost everything, but um, we got along fairly well. I know a couple of assembly persons, but um, it's tough when you're so philosophically divided and very few votes overlap. And granted, it was a very short session for me. There might have been more bipartisan issues that we could have agreed on in a longer term. Um, but I feel like those philosophical and legislative differences do uh, sometimes prevent that collegiality that you might have seen in years past. Well, to, to use the baseball analogy, you got a cup of coffee in the state senate. If anyone asked you how it could be improved in terms of more bi bipartisanship, working together, collegiality, what would you recommend, Senator? I, mean, I think people being open, and maybe, maybe it's happened that my time frame was just too short to see it, but I do think I would have liked to have talked to um, Senators Teston or Senator Fine or Senator Olson and, you know, or Senator Coles for that matter and say, you know, we might not agree on much, but why, you know, this is why I think this is a bad idea. And so whether it's coffee or lunch, but having substantive conversations that I know um, folks do have meetings across party lines and, and they are meaningful, but I think more of that uh, and even something, I don't know if a, a retreat is feasible, but enjoying time together and, and getting to know each other so you can have those trusted conversations. I feel pretty lucky. I don't feel like my trust was broken at all with anyone when I was here, so I'm appreciative of that, but uh, making sure that that stays uh, intact I think is important too for people to feel more willing to state their case and not feel vulnerable that they're going to be taken out of context or someone's you know, going to go talk to the press immediately and that kind of thing. So um, those are some ideas I would have. In your maiden speech, you said there's a difference between humiliation and humility. Can you explain that? Yeah, and so I think that's something that I've been noticing when I looked at, you know, what are some of the qualities that define really strong leaders and what are some of the qualities that define leaders that I personally find lacking. Um, you know, humiliation is different in, in the sense that humility, is, you know, humiliation involves embarrassment and shame, whereas humility is really just a reflection of reality and it involves the capacity for self-reflection, it in, involves, um, you know, being to, be able to admit when we're wrong uh, and just accepting what we are and what we are not and maybe what we can become. And so I was hoping, uh, especially, you know, having honored President George H.W. Bush earlier in the day and, of course, that very famous letter. You read letter, from his letter. Yeah, the letter the that went... Incoming President Clinton. Exactly, that that kind of humility that, you know, hey, your ideas won over the, the, po the voting populace. Um, you know, I'm here to, you know, reflect on, on why your ideas won and why mine didn't. And in the meantime, I'm here rooting for you. And that is, you know, perhaps obvious, not the spirit we saw in the lame duck session. And so that's, you know, when, when the voters reject uh, the agenda of the contemporary Republican Party in all five constitutional offices and in a margin of 54 to 46 in assembly races, there's an incredible opportunity for self-reflection there. And we're not seeing that happening. What we're seeing is the insertion of their failed agenda beyond its welcome term through these lame duck measures. The gap between Madison and outstate Wisconsin, do, does state government understand the needs and the issues in the first Senate district? Um, I think they do, and I, that's why I focus, you know, when I mentioned, you know, what was my top priority, be it, so much of it for me is wage growth. I think, obviously, economics are, are different. I drive through rural Wisconsin all over the state for hunting and fishing and visiting family all over uh, the northwest, the southwest, the central parts of the state, and um, you know, I, I do think folks there have a perception about Madison or about Milwaukee, but for me, it comes down to making sure that we, when we use taxpayer dollars to invest in industries or in companies and the economy as a whole, it has to be a comprehensive look at things beyond just additional workforce recruitment. And so all of Wisconsin, urban and rural, are aided by things like wage growth and making sure that they have adequate benefit packages. And I think that's been lacking the last eight years. In your speech, you said you didn't know what Republicans mean when they talk about, quote, a liberal agenda, close quote. You said progressive values will not result in people being run over by Priuses, ponytails flowing in the wind, or eating handful, handfuls of granola. Um, those are pretty symbolic issues, but what was your point? My point was that I think that the, the word choice by the Republican leaders and that they don't trust a liberal agenda, I think people have... Um, perhaps a, a caricature of what a liberal is or what they believe. And so when they use those phrases, we don't trust Tony Evers, we don't trust his liberal agenda. My point was that the wording that they've, they've chosen to use there is, is hyperbole and that what a real progressive agenda is, is fighting for wage growth, it's fighting for affordable health care, it's understanding that the dignity of hard work is not just the hard work itself, it's receiving a dignified life in return through things like wage growth and um, you know, being enough to be able to afford a roof of your head and food in your table and those kind of things. So it was more or less calling out the hyperbole of their um, messaging and pointing out that what we've campaigned on this entire season, and, and uh, I'm sure for years in advance, has been 
issues that affect common Wisconsinites that aren't wrapped up in what folks would mischaracterize of, of the caricature of a liberal with a level, leather elbow patch, tweed jacket, and corduroy pants, and a ponytail eating granola driving a priest. It's also ironic because you won't have a ponytail flowing in the wind. I think they call that a skullet when a bald guy <laughs> No, I will not have a ponytail anytime soon. Um, the special session was called the issue of providing tax breaks for Kimberly Clark. Your career, before you resigned to become a senator, was in economic development. Mm -hmm. Would you have voted for the Kimberly Clark tax bill? See, I think I would have, it's interesting, I unequivocally want Kimberly Clark to stay in Northeast Wisconsin and have them, uh, you know, those family, family sustaining jobs here, they've been here for 150 years. Um, it's interesting, I don't, we never got to see a bill, we never got to see what that would have looked like with the non woven mill closing. Um, I would have been a proponent of making sure that it was a strong deal for Wisconsin taxpayers. That's something I wanted to be a part of when I ran for this, was to be in those conversations advocating for Wisconsinites, but also making sure that we are strong shepherds of our taxpayer dollars, that companies that uh, receive taxpayer benefits have skin in the game and not just making their own investments, but repaying some of those tax credit programs and some of those loans. So um, having not seen what would have come forward, I can't say what that would have looked like, but I would have been a strong advocate for um, keeping Kimberly Clark here and hopefully including some skin in the game from there. But you aspect. never saw a Kimberly Clark tax breaks bill that you could have voted for, correct? Right. Well, I don't know about that, but I mean, we, we haven't seen, the assembly bill would have uh, ostensibly been, been different because of the non-woven's milk closing, but we, nothing came forward. It, uh, I think they didn't have the votes on either side. There were, I think, six or seven votes short on the Republican side, um, and then never brought it to the floor, which is interesting because that's why we were supposed to be in session and nothing came forward. So. Right. When Wisconsin and I interviewed you before the June 12th special session, I asked you about the Foxconn deal. That was before you served on the Weedick board. Mm -hmm. What have you since learned about the Foxconn deal that either makes it more acceptable or you're more concerned having now served on the board? Yeah, that's a great question. And so I think a lot of folks that have watched the Foxconn deal very closely, we just saw what happened with Amazon's HQ2. And so uh, Virginia, New York, and Tennessee came together in a three-state deal to provide, I believe, fewer, about the same number, maybe slightly fewer, I think 2.6 billion is a number in my head, 2.6 or 2.8 from those three states combined for four times as many jobs at three times the average wage. And people are still saying that's overpaying for what Amazon brought there. So what I've seen since Foxconn absolutely um, enhances what I believe was a, a bad deal for Wisconsin. I have no problem with Foxconn coming here and building um, a massive campus. I just think that the state paid way too much money for that. Um, and then the idea that it's pay as you grow, I mean, pay as you grow is, is the smart way to do that. However, it doesn't change the metrics in terms of uh, a per job incentive or the per job incentive against the average wage and the other relaxations that came as a part of that deal. Looking out then, given your expertise and being a member of the board, two, three years from now, do you not think we'll have a major Foxconn campus in Racine County? Do you think they will go back on their promises? I don't know. We'll see. I think it's going to be interesting without Governor Walker and the governor's mansion. I'm, I'm like the rest of Wisconsin, kind of watching with bated breath to see what Foxconn does. I think they felt they had a strong ally there. Uh, with the next nine months being kind of a strange um, period at Weedick with two new board members coming on where they can hire their own CEO and then Governor Evers can appoint his CEO on September 1st. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Foxconn and with other deals. Um, at this point, Wisconsin's guess is as good as mine as to what Foxconn's going to do. I think that they will probably reevaluate uh, now that Governor Walker is no longer here, but um, we'll see. It'll be interesting. I don't have the slightest clue what they're thinking as far as uh, moving forward without Governor Walker. Do you go off the Weedick board when your Senate yep, term I ends? Do. Yep. Um, would you like uh, Senate Democratic Leader Schilling to reappoint you and bring you back to that board? Um, I, I'd be open to that. Um, we have not discussed that. I guess I hadn't thought about that as a possibility. Um, it's interesting. Like I said, that's one of the reasons I wanted to run was to be part of those conversations and advocate for taxpayers. And I feel pretty strongly that my background in underwriting pr provides a pretty strong uh, analysis or skill set when it comes to analysis on what, what are our risks, how are we mitigating them, are Wisconsin taxpayers being protected, are they receiving return on investment that's adequate for the risks we're taking. And so even though I've maybe disagreed with the philosophies and, and some of the things that have gone on, I really enjoy the process and um, have loved digging into these deals. Governor-elect Evers, of course, have said that has said that he'd like to get rid of Weedick. It's not working. He'd like to go back to the commerce model or regional economic development. Do you agree that Weedick is broke and should be dissolved? 
I don't know if it's Brooke, there are, there are portions of Weedic that I think work really well. Uh, I'm a strong believer in entrepreneurial support. I'm a strong believer in community development. Uh, I'm a strong believer in um, workforce development, which may fall into other categories. I think you know, talent attraction is important uh, to Wisconsin winning the talent war. Um, but and we look at some of these, some of these large you know, tax credit programs that um, have come out of Weedic that essentially provide you know, massive payouts to executives and to shareholders, uh, and the repayment of those tax dollars or the replacement of the tax payments come from the wage earners of those companies. So it's not hyperbole to say that the wage earners at these companies are repaying the tax credits received by their, their um, shareholders and, and executives. So I, I think if we're going to be doing large scale economic development, it's important to make sure we're not subsidizing what would otherwise be market rate development and making sure that the, the wage earners at those companies, again, going back to the wage growth discussion, have an opportunity to see quality of life improvements and that we're not just uh, you know, using taxpayer dollars to, um, you know, retaining jobs is very important, but making sure that we're getting an adequate repayment for those tax dollars. Well, given that Speaker Voss and Senate Majority Leader Fitzgerald want to keep WEDIC around, and the governor-elect Evers wants to get rid of it, we're probably going to see Weedick around for a while. Mm -hmm. Do you think Mr. Hogan is the best one to continue to lead, lead it? So I've, I've known Mark for a long time. Uh, actually, when I took my first job out of college, it was as a credit bank, corporate banking trainee at m and Bank, and Mark was the chief credit officer at m and at that time. So I've known him for 11 or 12 years, and we have a great relationship. Um, I have a lot of respect for him. That'll be up to that group. I think, uh, yeah, I, we get along great. I respect him a lot. He's a smart guy. Um, I don't have um, a thought on, on what's going to happen there. I think, I, I think it's likely he'll stay um, for those nine months. And I know um, yeah, he's been very, very good at uh, keeping open lines of communication with me. And we've had very candid discussions. And so um, I've got a lot of respect for Mark. What are you going to do on January 8th? <laughs> I will probably um, be here. I'm coming down for the inaugural ball. But uh, at this point, I've been um, looking at different avenues, whether it's in nonprofit sector or potentially staying in politics or other venues that I think are interesting to me, but I've got a bit of a time crunch here when the, uh, the last paycheck comes on January 3rd. And uh, so it's interesting, it's, it's exciting, uh, but also um, yeah, a little nerve wracking at the same time trying to figure out what's next. But um, got a couple irons in the fire that I'm excited about, so we'll see where it goes from there. With your economic development um, experience, would you like to serve in the Evers administration? Have you applied? Um, I have uh, submitted an application kind of a, um, through their portal as to what, uh, what they have open for a couple different spots. So we'll see what they have. I think that process is, is moving as fast as, as they can move it. But uh, yeah, I'd be excited to help. Again, the reason I, I got into economic development in the first place and then got into politics was to improve the quality of life for the folks around me. So if there was a way to do that in the governor's administration, whether it's uh, economic development, workforce development, any other area where I could be of service to Wisconsinites, I'd certainly be open to it. And um, yeah, we'll see where the, what the timeframe looks like and what, uh, what we can do for that. Have you, uh, are you likely to run again for partisan office? Uh, I had a ton of fun. I had more fun than I ever expected. I'm kind of a, um, I'm well, not kind of, I'm an introvert by nature. So knocking on strangers doors and talking about politics was way out of my comfort zone. But uh, after about the first thousand doors, it wasn't that bad. And uh, so I, I'm not ruling it out. I think it's too early to, to say whether I will or not, but uh, I do have very, very fond memories. I have no regrets from our campaign. I'm proud of everyone that was involved. So having fond memories of it probably um, you know, doesn't rule out that possibility, but at this point in G uh, December of 2018, it's probably too early to tell. Well, you're, at the moment, you're a leader of the Wisconsin Democratic Party. Uh, your party has about 12 or 15 candidates for president. Who most <laughs> appeals to you? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's so early in the process. I'm a big fan, so having lived in the Twin Cities for a while, uh, I love Amy Klobuchar. I think she's just uh, incredibly bright and really strong. Um, I like Kamala Harris. I like Beta O'Rourke. Um, and those are kind of the, the main frontrunners. Elizabeth Warren's incredibly bright. I like her as well. So it's really early in the process. Uh, Joe Biden's a fighter. So two years out, I don't have a favorite, but I'm excited by the people that have kind of floated their names. And um, those are kind of the five that I think about when it comes to 2020 that... Uh, I think would have a pretty good shot um, at winning the nomination, hopefully winning the White House. Do you plan to stay in Wisconsin in some capacity? Oh yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, so my, all my nuclear family was here and, and that's why I moved back a few years ago. And um, yeah, it's funny. It, my identity just is so interwoven with being in Wisconsin and I really like, um, as an outdoorsman, the hunting opportunities here are really second to none with the exception of maybe a few mountain states in Alaska. So being a deer hunter, a waterfowler, a turkey hunter, and a fisherman, um, 
and having been here for 34 years now, um, understanding the, the, the licensure process and all the deadlines, it's just, it's funny that that's a really strong consideration, but it is for me that um, I really enjoy Wisconsin's outdoor activities and it'd be hard for me to go somewhere else and, and do this again. So if Governor Evers picks you as the cabinet secretary, you'll do a newsmaker's inter interview with uh, Wisconsin Eye? Well, heck yeah, I'd be, I'd be all about it. We've had good, uh, our interview back in May went well, and although I was really tired that day, I think we were just like scrambling from <laughs> campaigning and I was exhausted, so I'm glad I hopefully made sense, but uh, yeah, I would certainly be up for talking to you guys again whenever that makes sense. So a high school or college student comes to you and says, uh, Caleb, I'm thinking about entering politics. What's your advice to she or he? Uh, so, also, a very good question. So I would say, you know, build your skill set around whatever it is you're passionate about, whether that's the environment, whether it's business, whether it's law. Um, but having a deep understanding and building a skill set around um, uh, analysis, communication, uh, being able to clearly state your ideas. It doesn't have to be political science. It can be, like I said, you know, my. My major was real estate and urban land economics, and although if I could do it over again, I don't know if I'd do that, that skill set was extremely helpful in understanding policy and understanding uh, the impacts of, of financial statements and those kind of things. So even though it was kind of a windy road, uh, the path that I might not choose again was a great path to get me to a spot where I could communicate clearly, uh, understand higher level concepts, understand the validity of arguments. So I would just say, throw yourself into whatever you're passionate about and the skills you gain in that process will help you in politics no matter if it's, like I said, environmental, business, uh, education, law, all those things that help you out. Well, just a couple of final questions. As an economic development, that's been your career. Where does Wisconsin, what does Wisconsin has, have to offer a company when it comes to the issue of locating in Wisconsin or expanding here? What's your, what's your elevator speech, your selling point for Wisconsin at large? Not Door County, yeah. but Wisconsin. So Wisconsin at large, I think that the selling point has to be you know, we have to have a, a saleable bill of goods. I think it's a combination of promotion and attraction. We have to promote what's great about Wisconsin, but also provide an attractive bill of goods. And I think we have that, and I think we can enhance that, but it's, it's high quality education, both at the you know, K through 12 and higher education level. It's a skilled workforce. It's a, a hardworking workforce, uh, and it's recreational opportunities. I think you know, perhaps trying to convince millennials in Chicago that taking public transit was a bad idea was a bad idea, but if we can say you can be on your bicycle uh, for a three-hour ride starting at 507 living in um, you know Lake Geneva or Toma or Ladysmith you know those type of things really are compelling and so in winning I think so much of economic development going forward is going to be winning that battle on uh, for talent if we can convince talent to live in Wisconsin I think we can make enhancements by investing in child care by investing in our broadband infrastructure in rural Wisconsin you know we can create a really attractive bill of goods that'll attract talent which in this day and age uh, can't help but to attract more employers as well. The shipbuilding industry is vital to Northeast Wisconsin, including the first Senate district. How's it doing? Is it on an up or uh, up or down? Uh, from my understanding, talking to the folks at Bay Ship, um, they are getting really creative. I think they continue to build freighters and tugs. Uh, there's military contracts uh, that continue to come through Marinette Marine. Um, but they're getting creative. They're building fishing vessels. And so, uh, at least in, in my hometown of Sturgeon Bay, that's a you know, a bastion of, of multiple hundreds, sometimes over a thousand union jobs that are, you know, paid for a lot of college educations and a lot of mortgages in Northeast Wisconsin. So uh, it's an industry we watch very closely. And so I'm, I'm encouraged by their creativity and I'm encouraged by, you know, politicians of both stripes coming together to help make Northeast Wisconsin and Great Lakes states competitive when it comes to building ships for military purposes, for freight purposes, uh, to keep that a, a viable industry in this area. Okay, I see the deer head. You're obviously an avid, an avid deer hunter. Do you eat all that venison? I do. Well, I give a fair amount of it away, but I do eat uh, an inordinate amount of wild game. I don't buy a lot of uh, grocery store meat with the exception of bacon, um, but between wild turkey, uh, I got a bear this year, ducks, geese, and venison, I have a large chest freezer that uh, keeps me pretty well fed and well insulated um, year round. So yes, I do eat a lot of venison. I should probably be sponsored by Kingsford Charcoal and <laughs> Weber Grills, but um, yeah, that's one of the things my family was very, uh, I come from a large hunting family, but also the importance of not just eating it, but cooking it in a way that tastes really, really good. So I've developed some pretty good recipes as far as deer, bear, and turkey and waterfowl. Last question. We're in a building where people tend to take themselves very seriously. You don't seem to be taking yourself too seriously as you exit the Senate. Why? Uh, I, I try to be my authentic self. I, I've, I've in different times in my life, you know, kind of been forced to be less than my authentic self. In the corporate world, I was in banking for nine years, and so you have 
suit up and show up and kind of uh, exist in a stuffy environment and that was suffocating to me and so um, when I turned 30 it sounds kind of cliche but just realized life was too short and I'm gonna be me and I'm gonna be tactful and civil and, and try to be professional but um, you know I'm a I'm a relatively I, I've been told a funny guy I've been I've done stand-up comedy I've done improv and so I'm not gonna change who I am to try to appease people I'm gonna like I said be nice about it be civil but I'm certainly not gonna um, you know, act in a way that's not in accordance with my personal constitution. And a lot of times that means being a little goofy and that seems to work out okay for me, so. Democratic Senator Caleb Frostman, thanks for the, thanks exit, thanks for the egg, exit interview and good luck. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. Thank you. You bet.